Good evening and welcome to Phoenix Fellowship's Interactive Bible Study. We are interactive tonight. You might ask why, how is this interactive when I'm just talking to you? You may be missing out on the interactive part by not joining our Zoom meeting at the end of this presentation. What we do every Wednesday evening is we make a presentation on prophecy. We're doing a study of prophecy right now. And then at the end of that presentation, a couple of minutes we set up for Zoom and at 7.30, we have a Zoom meeting, a discussion meeting. If you feel shy and you don't want your picture shown on a Zoom meeting, you don't have to turn on your video. If you don't wanna talk, you don't have to turn on your mic. You can just sit in the background and listen to the discussion if you want. So don't feel uneasy about joining us in our Zoom meeting because it really turns out to be a fun discussion and we pray together and we answer questions and we talk about the things of the Bible. So this evening, we're going to actually expand our study of the prophecies of Daniel. We had Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which Daniel got a vision of so that he could interpret in Daniel 2. Then Daniel had his own vision in Daniel 7. And tonight, we're going to be looking at his second vision in Daniel 8. God had blessed Daniel immensely to entrust with, with him all the information that we are now enjoying and benefiting from. So I hope that you will be blessed tonight. I want you to know that I feel so blessed just to be standing in front of you. I, you are spending your evening with us and I wanna thank you for taking the time to join us in a study of God's word. Before we begin, let's pray. Father in heaven, tonight we are so grateful to you for the information and the inspiration that you've given us in your word. We are so grateful that you have entrusted us with the Holy Spirit who is given to us to understand. And you tonight, Lord, want to show us some things from your word that are relative to our future and in understanding that which is to come. And we pray that your spirit will lead us and use us tonight, use me to speak for you, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So tonight, we're going to look at some things that we've already talked about as a foundation. What I'd like to do is to kind of gather the pieces up together in an organized fashion, because tonight will be our last night studying Daniel until we have studied a couple of chapters in the book of Revelation. Next week, we're going to actually open the book of Revelation and study from that book that John wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And to see the things which God showed his servants, us, through John, so that we might know those things which are shortly to take place. A direct quote from Revelation chapter one. So tonight, let's go back, way back to the beginning, and we're gonna kinda of go through these slides rather quickly, but I want to summarize and gather together that which we have studied so what we study tonight makes sense. And as we leave the book of Daniel, I want to have a good foundation for us to open the book of Revelation. First of all, Matthew 24. Remember, Matthew 24, our very first study, Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley from the city of Jerusalem on a Tuesday evening as he leaves the temple for the last time before his death. And as they sit there looking back, the sun is no doubt shining on the beautiful temple that has been built. And the disciples look at, look at it and they say, Lord, look at this. This is so beautiful. And Jesus said, I tell you, not one stone will be left upon another at some point in the future. And so they equated that with the end of the world and with his coming, his return, because he said he was going away and he would come back. So, um, so they're looking at this temple and they say to Jesus, Lord, how are we going to know when this is going to happen and when the end of the world is coming and when your return? Three questions they asked him. <laughs> And he answered all three. 
in the verses that follow. There are two separate prophecies that Jesus gave in Matthew 24 that are intertwined and one in front of the other, one behind the other. The destruction of Jerusalem, which took place in AD 70, was one of the prophecies that Jesus gave. They said, when are these things going to happen when not one stone is left upon another? So Jesus said, this is gonna happen. These are the things that will take place, and they did. Right to the word of Jesus Christ, they took place during the, cent the centuries, not the centuries, the decades that followed before the destruction of Jerusalem. But Jesus also, as we read Matthew 24, told them what the signs of his coming would be and when the end of the world would come. What we would know, what we would look for to know that that was coming. And so Matthew 24, we have made the template, and I believe it's a great template for us to understand all prophecy. Then we went to Revelation chapter six. In Revelation chapter six, we found a parallel passage to what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 24. Right, right down the line, point by point, we compared those, those two passages, Revelation 6 and Matthew 24, and saw how they intertwined and how the, the, prophecy in, the prophecies of the four horsemen and the four horses in Revelation 6 actually paralleled what Jesus said would take place in Matthew 24. It all ended where? Where did that prophecy end? At the end, at the end, with the coming of Jesus, the end of the world. This is a principle that we find throughout the prophecies of the Bible, is God takes us down a path. He, it's like a, a video almost. He takes us down a path, a journey of history for us now, so a lot of it, and he takes us down this road to show us where his people have been, where we have been in his people, and where we are today, and where we're going, and what is at the end. I love the picture, we're not gonna show it tonight, but I love the picture of Jesus on a white horse, riding through the clouds of heaven to earth, with the armies of heaven following him in white linen to rescue his children from the persecution and the abuse of the Antichrist, which is, which is part of that time of tribulation that takes place. All ends with Jesus Christ returning and rescuing his people, taking them back to the place he has prepared for them. Then we went to Daniel chapter two. And in Daniel two, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He couldn't understand it. He couldn't even remember the dream. So Daniel ends up being the hero in this picture. Really, it's God because in the end, God is the one that gets all the glory from Daniel's mouth as well as from Nebuchadnezzar's. And this dream of the great image has four metals, a head of gold, a chest of silver, a thigh of bronze, legs of iron, and then the feet, a mixture of iron and clay. A very important point I wanna make, and that is, that the iron continues into the feet. It doesn't change substance in the feet. The iron is part of the final picture. The iron and what that kingdom represents is part of the final picture of this earth's history just before the rock comes cut out without hands and smashes the feet and image of, of Daniel's uh, of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and Jesus Christ sets up his kingdom. Again, the end, what is the end? The end is Jesus coming and setting up his kingdom. Then in Daniel 7, last week we studied Daniel 7, there are four great creatures, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the nondescript beast that had 10 horns, out of which came a little horn. We're going to go back to the parts of Daniel 7 tonight in order to compare with some of the verses of Daniel 8 because there's a very important connection between those two chapters as it pertains to this little horn power. And 
might I say that these prophecies reach all the way back into history, but they're like a funnel that leads us all to a point in time that is yet future that ends with the coming of Jesus Christ. He promised he would come back. He will come back. And these prophecies tell us what is going to take place in the world before he returns. And honestly, the prophecies that are still yet to be fulfilled are the focus, really the focus of these chapters. You might think, well, we're spending so much time on the metals and the beasts and the horns and all of these things that are being described. Really, they are all leading to a focal point on the little horn power that persecutes the people of God at the end of time. We still have that yet to talk about, but it all is pointing to that point in time. This is the foundation that is being set for us to understand those things which are yet future. Now, included in these portraits of the end is the Great Tribulation. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24? There would be a time of trouble such as has not been since the end in the past or in the future, ever. He says we're going to face a time of trouble like never before. The Great Tribulation is included in these portraits. The return of Jesus is included in these portraits. And often we will see reference to a judgment that takes place. Nothing for us to fear because Jesus said in the, in the book of John, he said, he who believes in me has passed from death to life and shall not enter into judgment. Praise God for that. There is a judgment coming, but we have been judged in the person of Jesus Christ. We were judged with him on the cross, on Calvary's cross. We were there in him as he took us in himself to the cross, paid our sins so that we do not have to go through the judgment. That would be double jeopardy. To have to pay for our sins by facing a judgment and a condemning sentence would be double jeopardy because Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary paid for our sins. There is no second judgment, second death for those who are in Christ. No judgment for them. So these things are things that we have and we'll talk about even more. I'd like now to go to the book of Daniel chapter 8 and we're going to read through the first eight verses. We have new imagery here in these, in these verses. But you're going to see that there is another parallel of what we have already studied recorded in these verses. Daniel 8 beginning with verse 1 and I am reading in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. Who was King Belshazzar? He was the last king of Babylon. He is the one that the Medes and the Persians came and took over the city. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. What is he referring to? He's referring to the one he had in Daniel chapter seven that he records in Daniel chapter seven. He has another vision, a second vision. And verse two says, and I saw in vision, and it so happened while I was looking that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is a, a, a fortress palace. That's what a citadel is which was in the province of Elam, and I saw in vision that I was by the river Uli. Now I looked up on the map, and Uli is kind of equidistant east of Babylon and north of the Persian Gulf. So you can kind of imagine sort of where that is. Babylon, of course, is where Iraq is today. And, uh, and um, so we have, uh, uh, what's the name of the city in, Iraq, uh, Baghdad, Baghdad. Iraq, uh, Babylon was around where Baghdad is, and and so the river of 
uh, Ulai was east of Babylon and north of the Persian Gulf. So he says, and I saw in the vision, uh, I lifted up my eyes, verse three, then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns. But one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. Now, I think we will see what this is later on, but you'll remember in, in Daniel chapter seven, there was a bear that was raised up on one side. One shoulder was higher than the other. This is just another representation of the same power. So one horn was higher than the other and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward and southward. In other words, every direction so that no animal could withstand him nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. Verse five, and as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. What did we learn in previous studies that horns represent. <clears throat> horns represent a division of power. There's only one horn, there's only one, one power. And this power was coming across the earth from the west so fast and so quickly and swiftly that he wasn't even touching the ground, it said. And he had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing by the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, <clears throat> attacked the ram, and broke his two horns, that is, the horns of the ram. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore, the male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds or the four directions of heaven. So these are the first eight verses of Daniel 8, and you may already have an idea of what these animals represent. I hope because, again, we are looking at parallels in prophecy. The imagery changes, but the story is the same. So let's go to verse 20, and we're going to read verses 20 through 22. And uh, Daniel is being told what these animals represent. So this is another one of those things that God does for us. He says, here, I want to show you something. And then he takes the pieces of the puzzle and says, put this piece here and put that piece here. That's what this piece is. And this is where this piece goes. He wants us to know the things that are coming upon this world and upon us and are part of our lives. So in, in Daniel 8 and verse 20, he says, the ram which you saw having the two horns are what? The kings of Media and Persia. Did you guess that already? Remember the bear? He's raised up on one side, and one is in this, and in Daniel 8 we have, we have the, the, uh, the ram with two horns, and one is higher than the other, and the higher one comes up last, Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece, and the large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. 
So what did we learn last week about, about Medo-Persia and Greece? What did we learn about them? First of all, Medo-Persia was a family operation. Darius was the Mede, and his nephew Cyrus was the Persian. Darius is the one that went in under his direction and took over Babylon, but Cyrus, the Persian, is the one that became the most powerful in the Medo-Persian Empire, and he came up last, right? Just like this horn. One horn is higher than the other, but the, the, the higher one came up last. So Cyrus is the stronger of the two rulers of the Medo-Persian Empire. And by the way, last week we looked at those maps and saw how massive these empires were in, uh, in that area of the world, in the Mediterranean region. So the ram and the goat. So who is the goat with the notable horn? The, the goat represents a kingdom, just like Medo-Persia, the, the bear and the ram represent a kingdom. These animals represent kingdoms, world kingdoms. And so who is the goat? The goat is Greece. And who is the first king? The one with the, is represented by the notable horn, Alexander the Great. He was a mighty warrior. He was 32 when he died, but he conquered the world during his lifetime as a young man. Now, when he died, it says, when the horn, verse 22, when the horn, the bro horn was broken, there were four that stood up in its place. Four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with the same power. And so the four generals that Alexander the Great had that were, that were uh, working with him in his conquests took over his kingdom and divided the kingdom into four different parts. One of those kingdoms was the Seleucid kingdom. Ptolemy was another one, Thrace was another one, and uh, then there was a, a fourth one. So these four kingdoms came out of Alexander the Great's kingdom, Alexander the Great's kingdom when he died. So now what I would like to do, because we have looked at Daniel 2, we have looked at Daniel 7, we have looked at Daniel, we're going to look at Daniel 8. Let's look at a slide that compares each of these visions according to the kingdoms that are represented and the metals and the beasts and the horns that they represent. First of all, you have the image laying on his side. That's only because it makes it easier to show the parallels with the kingdoms that are shown and talked about in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. So the head of gold represents the Babylonian Empire. In Daniel 7, the lion represents the Babylonian Empire. In Daniel 2, the Medo-Persian Empire is represented by the chest of silver. In Daniel 7, it's the bear. In Daniel 8, it's the ram. You see that? So the, the, uh, the waste of bronze represents the Grecian Empire in Daniel 2. In Daniel 7, it's the leopard. And in Daniel 8, it's the he-goat. And then we have the Western Church and the Eastern Church represented here. This particular image shows two, two, different, um, um, two different divisions of the, the Roman Church, and that is true, but we haven't come to that yet in our study. We have the two legs of iron, which represent the Roman Empire in Daniel 2. And in Daniel 7, we have this monstrous beast that has 10 horns, 10 horns and a little horn that comes out of the 10 and uproots three others. So these, these are the comparisons between the various prophecies that we have studied. 
I wish I could say to you, does anybody have any questions so far? <laughs> well, we'll do that in our meeting to follow perhaps, but it's so fascinating to see that God gives us vision after vision to establish in our minds the pattern and where is he taking us? He's taking us down to the end of time, particularly in the book of Revelation, where he will show us in detail the things that are to transpire before he comes. Now, I'd like to have you get your Bibles if you have them nearby because some of this material we're gonna actually read because we're kind of going back and forth between verses. But the first thing I wanna talk about is the destruction of Jerusalem. So in Matthew 24, Jesus gave us two prophecies. One was the prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem and the other was the prophecy of those events that would immediately precede his coming. Centuries apart, nevertheless, very similar in nature. And he gave us the prophecy of what was happening or what was going to happen in Jerusalem to help us understand those things which would take place later. Think of it this way. The destruction of Jerusalem is like a backdrop for the end of time. We see in the destruction of Jerusalem some of the same elements that take place as we study the points of prophecy that have to do with the end of time. So, for instance, there were, there were people who were talking about Messiah coming. There were false prophets in the days prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. How about this one? The Roman armies are the ones that destroyed Jerusalem, but they came, they came to Jerusalem in AD, in the fall of AD 66, to take Jerusalem, because in AD 66, in the fall of AD 66, there was a group of zealots that actually besieged the Roman garrison in Jerusalem and began to create a, what's called the first war, the first uh, war between Israel and Rome, the first Jewish war. And this began in AD 66. There's going to be a point in time where we look back to this story and look at that time frame the fall of AD 66 until the spring of AD 70, when Jerusalem was actually destroyed, is how long? The fall of AD 66 to the spring of AD 70, when Jerusalem was actually destroyed. That is a period of three and a half years. We're going to see that time element in in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation as we continue our study. But Jerusalem fell just as Jesus said it would. And the Roman armies surrounded the city, were routed by the Jews, and then came back three and a half years later and actually destroyed Jerusalem. Jesus said, Jesus said through Luke, when you see the armies surrounding the city, know that the destruction is near. Know, and believe it or not, there were Christians in the city who remembered that prophecy and who escaped. When the Romans were routed in the fall of AD 66, they escaped and they did not die in the destruction of Jerusalem three and a half years later. These are elements that we're going to look at again. So, Matthew 24 is repeated in Daniel 8. How? We have the same situation where literal Israel is experiencing something that spiritual Israel will experience later, and that becomes a backdrop and a type for that which takes place at the end of time. Let's look at Daniel 7, beginning with verse 23. Follow with me in your Bibles. Daniel 7, beginning with verse 23. 
This is the fourth beast. And the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms. Remember, this is the nondescript beast that we talked about last week. And shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. What, what beast, what power did that represent? That was the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was the fourth beast and it had 10 horns. And these, it says, are 10 kings who shall arise from this kingdom. And we talked last week about how out of Rome, there were approximately 10 kingdoms that some of which can now be found in our world today, like France and you know, Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, Europe and, and the German uh, element, the Huns, and various of these, the Huns, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Heruli, the Burgundy, Burgundians, and the Lombardians, all of these nations that came out of Rome, uh, the Ten Horns that came out of Rome, are still nations today. What did, what did God tell Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel in Daniel chapter 2? that the element of Rome would continue through to the end of the world to, to when the stone is cut out without hands and comes and crushes this image. But these nations that are associated with this element of Rome will not, will not cling together. They will mingle, but they will not adhere together as a world kingdom like all of the kingdoms before. So, it says in verse 24, the 10 horns are 10 kings who shall arise from this kingdom, the kingdom, the empire of Rome, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. And he did. He shall speak pompous words against the most high. He shall persecute the saints of the most high. He shall think to change times and laws. That seems odd. Why would we be concerned about a power changing times and laws? We have different times now and we have different laws in various parts of the world. These are obviously not the times and the laws of the world, but the times and the law of God. He shall think to change. He shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and a half a time. What is that? Well, if you go back to uh, Daniel chapter 4 and verse 16, where we have the story of Nebuchadnezzar having to... Um, he, you know, he goes out on the balcony of his, his uh, palace one day and he looks over the kingdom and says, look at this great kingdom that I have built. Uh, aren't I great? And he's basically kind of worshiping himself. He's so proud. And he ends up having, God judges him for his pride. And he ends up eating with the beasts of the field for, for how long? Well, what does it say? Daniel 4, verse 16 says, Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast. And let seven times pass over him. Seven times. If you look in your margin, it'll tell you that a time represents a year. So we have seven times, seven years. Nebuchadnezzar ate grass. You can imagine what he looked like at the end of that that period of time. Over here we have this power having uh, power over the saints for a time. What's a time? A year. Times, plural, two, and a half a time. What is one plus two plus a half? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. Yet used to this time prophecy because we see it over and over again in Daniel and Revelation. This is an important piece 
of information in understanding those things which are to come. The saints shall be given into his hand. This power will have power over the saints for time, times, half a time, for three and a half years. We'll come to that again. But the first question I want to ask now is about this. Where does this little horn's power come from? Out of what empire does this little horn power come? I can't hear you. What are you telling me? It's Rome. The fourth beast, the fourth, the fourth beast, this nondescript beast in Daniel 7, 10 horns, and out of, out of, from between these horns comes a little horn power. It comes out of Rome. No wonder that we have iron continuing into the feet of the image of Daniel 2. Rome is still around in a different form, which we'll talk about too. But this little horn power comes out of the empire of Rome. Now, I want to go to Daniel 8, again in verses 8 and 9. And we find there these words, Therefore the male goat, goat who is the male goat? Well, Greece, and, uh, and it says, but when he became very great, he grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in its place came four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. So who is this? Alexander the Great, he dies, his four generals, remember, his four generals take over the kingdom, and Notice, notice, it says, out of one of them came a little horn. Out of one of which came a little horn. Out of one of those four horns that took the place of Alexander's power. One of his generals, out of, out of, and it turns out this one comes out of Seleucid. The same, the same power, the same division of power that we noted earlier that I couldn't pronounce, Seleucid. This little horn comes out of what empire? Greece. What empire did the other little horn come out of? Rome. I want to talk about that tonight in our, in our Zoom meeting. Let's talk about this tonight because this is really an important point. Now, in verse 17 and onward, it says, so when I came near... When, when he, that is Gabriel, came near in verse 16, when he came near to where I stood and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, is Gabriel talking to Daniel, understand that this vision refers to the time of the end. How could it refer to the time of the end if it's way back in the time of Greece? It does. What did I say earlier? Matthew 24 is repeated in Daniel 8. In Daniel 8, we have literal Israel being persecuted by a little horn power, which is representative and a type of another little horn power that comes out of Rome that persecutes the saints in the latter time. What does it say? It says, this vision refers to the time of the end. So, verse 18, now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and stood me upright. And he said, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation. And, for the, and at the appointed time, the end shall be. What have we seen throughout our prophecy studies thus far? It all ends at the end. All the, the various nations, all the various imagery comes to an end at the very end of time when what happens? Jesus Christ comes through the clouds of heaven to 
to rescue his people. So I wanted you to see these verses in Daniel 8 because first of all, we're saying that this little horn power of Daniel 8 does not come out of Rome like the one in Daniel 7 does. It comes out of Greece, but it also has a type. It is also a shadow, just like the destruction of Jerusalem is a shadow of the events of the end of time in Matthew 24. So in Daniel 8, we have this power that comes out of Greece, this little horn power, just as we saw in Matthew 24. Now, in chapter 8 and verse 26, it says, chapter 8 and verse 26, <clears throat> And the vision of the evenings and the mornings. Vision. The vision of the evenings and the mornings. What vision of the evenings and the mornings? Which was told is true. Therefore seal up the vision for it refers to many days in the future. Oh, we went past a verse in Daniel chapter 8 that we're going to talk about tonight in our Zoom meeting. I hope you are there. So in Daniel 8, we have a description of this power. This power in, uh, in verse, um, verse 9 and onward. Let's read verse Daniel 8, verse 9, all the way to verse 14. And out of one of them, that is out of one of these um, notable horns that came up, the Seleucid kingdom, out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, and it did. Toward the east, and it did. And toward the glorious land, where is the glorious land? It's Palestine. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. So it looks a little bit like what we read in Daniel 7. And he exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. This is a power that is against God. This is a type of the Antichrist. This is a, this is a, a shadow power of the Antichrist. Remember, he comes out of Greece, not Rome. It's a different power. It's a different little horn. But, he's, but he has all of the characteristics of the little horn power of Daniel 7. And then I heard a holy one, verse 13, speaking. And another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation and the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. You see who this power is. He is an enemy of God, an enemy of God's people. He is an enemy of God's people. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That word cleansed can also be translated vindicated or set right or justified, put back in order. The sanctuary will be cleansed. 2,300 mornings and evenings. Same language as we find in Genesis 1. Mornings and evenings. And the evening and the morning was the first day. So 2,300 literal days. Sanctuary will be trodden down and the people of God trodden down. Literal Israel of old. And how long? 2,300 days. How long is 2,300 days? It's not 1,260. It's not a time times and dividing of time. It's not a time times and half a time. It's not three and a half years. 2,300 days is equivalent to six years plus, six years and four months plus, about six years, four months and 18 days, 
when you divide it up, 30 days or a month, six years and four months plus. So, this is, I, I want you to know I've been so excited about studying this today. <clears throat> Who is this sinister power that is talked about? Well, I want to go back another, another text in chapter 12. We're going to go to chapter 12 just for another text to compare with the one we read in Daniel 8 and verse 26 where it says, to Daniel, seal up the vision for it refers to many days in the future. In Daniel 12 and verse 7, we have another power that is against the people of God. And in Daniel 7, it says, I heard a man, the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times and half time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. And I, although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? Isn't that the same question he asked in chapter eight? What is going to be the end of these things? And this holy one, this one that he's talking to, probably Gabriel himself, or maybe Jesus here, I don't know. He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the end of time. Same language as we find in chapter 8. Listen, I want to tell you something. This power that is spoken of in Daniel 8, a little horn power, is a Grecian ruler. He is a little horn power that persecuted the people of God, not for three and a half years, for, for six years and four months plus. I want to show you another slide. The slide of this little horn, little horn image of Daniel 8. Daniel 8. Let's look at what it says. By the way, this is a watermark. This is a watermark. So between 171 and 165 BC, a king of the Grecian Seleucid Empire by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes made it his express purpose to eliminate Judaism as a religion in his empire. During this period, approximately 2,300 days, as per the prophecy of Daniel 8.14, his reign over the Jews was marked by horrific destruction, desecration, and bloodshed. He tortured and murdered thousands who refused to abandon their faith. One estimate is 80,000 Jews were either murdered or sold to slavery during this period of time. Among the forbidden practices which were, were for him the rite of circumcision, the study of the Torah and the keeping of the Jewish, Jewish dietary laws, all of which, the violation of which could be death. The Jews' holy temple, he placed a statue of Zeus, the God he believed was manifested in his own royal being, and he sacrificed swine on the altar. He stripped the temple of its sacred vessels, including the seven-branched golden menorah, and he stole the silver and the gold. Antiochus Epiphanes is the type of the Antichrist in the Old Testament for literal Israel. The little horn power of Daniel 7 is the Antichrist of spiritual Israel at the end of time. 
And Daniel 8 gives us a shadow picture of the Antichrist. Now, if you think that this guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, was just some sort of, just little piece of history that had no, had no impact on the present day, tell me something. What is Hanukkah all about for the Jews of today? Why do they celebrate Hanukkah every year? Eight days, a feast for Hanukkah. They are celebrating. To this day, they celebrate the recovery from Antiochus Epiphany, Epiphanes, the recovery and the restitution of the temple and temple worship. Yes, Hanukkah is a big deal for literal Israel. The little horn power of Daniel 8 is from Greece. He reigned and persecuted the Jews for six years, a little more than six years. From, what was the date again? From 171 BC to 165 BC. That's going backwards now because 171 is further back than 164. So this is the length of time that he persecuted literal Israel as the little horn power of Daniel 7 will persecute the people of God. We will find this in the book of Revelation when we open that book starting next week. Let's talk about this tonight. What do you say? And let's pray right now. Father in heaven, Thank you for this puzzle. Thank you for giving us the understanding of how to put this puzzle together by naming these nations, by giving us information that helps us to lay out this picture of prophecy of which we are a part in the timeline and we are approaching the end of time when all of these things that are prophesied will be fulfilled. What a privilege to live in.